uh, um, uh, much like Kat, um, we've uh, developed this presentation between myself and Duncan Brown from Historic England, who's uh, presenting in, uh, in the South. Um, so uh, some of the case studies are mine, some will be him, his uh, from Southampton and Historic England. Um, and uh, the, the main thrust really of the next hour is to introduce you to archaeological archives, um, what they are, where they come from and what to do with them. Um, uh, it's a lot to try and pack, because that's you know, the planning process to start with, just a lot to pack into an hour. Um, uh, so I'll do my best and then um, I'm here uh, to answer any questions uh, afterwards. So um, as you probably are aware of, the, the national picture concerning archaeological archives is, is concerning and has been, I think, for, for a number of years. Um, there was a realisation, I think, um, in the sector that uh, the situation was very difficult um, and there were lots of issues around particularly space in collecting archaeological archives, um, but there was no real hard evidence of, of, of exactly where we were at. So in 2012, the Society for Museum Archaeology commissioned um, a kind of state of the nation type uh, survey of archaeological archives and collecting, and then went on to uh, a, a three-year project to look at the changes in collecting year on year from 2016 to 2018, a, a project which some of you may well have um, contributed towards. And um, these are the results from uh, the 2016 survey. Um, which found that of 154 museums that curate archaeological archives, um, 119 are still collecting, which means that 35 museums no longer um, collect archaeology. And I, I believe that figure's got worse since then. Um, the, the really worrying um, aspects are, are what happens as we go forward. 61 of the, uh, of the museums that are collecting think they'll run out of space within five years. And uh, by 2027, 112 may well have stopped collecting archaeology. Um, it's not just space that's the issue and, and, and where to put archaeological archives. Uh, there's been this um, massive drop in specialist archaeological curators as well, um, uh, which obviously impacts on, on the entire uh, uh, process and, um, and who manages it. And so there are various dif uh, different definitions of archaeological archive. They're, they're all very, very similar. This is the Arches definition. It comprises all the records and the material objects um, from an archaeological project. Um, that can be artifacts, ecofacts, environmental waste, scientific samples, and uh, crucially also uh, a, a digital material. Um, So, uh, what the archaeological archive comprises is slightly more complex than that. Um, there's the working project archive, which is all of the material and documentation and digital information that's created um, while uh, uh, an investigation is ongoing. And then there's the preserved archaeological archive, which are those elements that are selected for long-term preservation in a museum or a repository. And there's also that between the two, that it's not just that they're made up of different objects uh, and materials, but there's that crucial change that happens at the moment of deposition where um, uh, it go, you know, an archive goes from something that's working to something uh, that needs long-term preservation and, and curation. So the majority of archaeological archives, as Kat suggested, um, come through uh, the um, planning system and development control. Um, archaeology has been um, uh, part of uh, the, the planning system and protected within it since uh, the 1990s. Um, first with PPG 15 and PPG 16. Then very briefly, pa planning policy statement 5, which didn't seem to last very long at all. And um, uh, more recently, the national planning policy framework um, and uh, museums are a footnote in the uh, NPPF. Um, uh, the footnote says that copies of evidence should be deposited with the relevant historic environment, environment record and any archives with a local museum or other public depository. So it falls short of actually saying that archives must go to a museum. It's probably the closest that museums get to a statutory service within a sort of local authority framework. Um, but it does leave the, the door open to, to, to that uh, repository being 
something else. And in various parts of the country, there are there are different models. Um, sometimes uh, you know, st uh, archaeological storage can be within uh, the HER or within a university. It's not always within a local museum. And so for archives that are generated through planning, you are essentially part of a system. So um, a developer will make a planning application. And, um, and within this system, I would suggest that the planning archaeologist is your closest ally. Um, they're the ones that can um, make your life a lot easier. You can make their life uh, a lot easier as well. Um, because planning archaeologists um, will uh, add planning conditions uh, uh, for archaeological work if they think that there's a, um, a possibility of archaeological potential. And within that brief, really, that's your, that's your opportunity to uh, uh, lay down the guidelines on everything you want to happen at the end of the project and a, de a deposition. So that's where things like fees and charges can go in, selection and retention, um, where exactly you want the archive to be deposited. Um, in order for um, units and developers to uh, um, um, make good on all of those guidelines, it really does need to be in right at the beginning of the process. And I would suggest that actually that's a developing relationship. Um, uh, I would start uh, very simply with some general um, uh, guidelines that are important to your institution. And then from then on, you can sort of um, pad that out into something much more meaningful. So uh, commercial units will tender for uh, investigations. Um, uh, there can be a whole host of different investigations, which I'll come on to later, not just excavation. Um, your archive will spend some significant amount of time often in post-excavation analysis um, in order to compile uh, uh, and publish a report. Um, and then uh, once that report is signed off by planning and uh, your historic environment record potentially, um, uh, uh, you are only really then at a point where perhaps you should consider um, taking deposition of the archive. So there are other um, types of organisations that will create archives, not just um, commercial units. Uh, universities um, will often do so. They're working to a different research agenda. Um, they often don't have trained specialist um, uh, archives officers or archive staff. Uh, community projects, um, sometimes with external uh, specialists brought in, sometimes not, often very passionate and committed individuals, but again without perhaps some of the archive specialisms um, that you'll find um, amongst your uh, commercial organisations. And then most difficult of all sometimes really are the unplanned excavations that are associated with specific finds. They can often be treasure finds, but or, um, but actually can be a whole range of things. This is a Worcestershire example, um, a, uh, um, a mammoth tusk discovered on a quarry site um, just south of Worcester. Um, uh, um, and in, in that instance, actually, um, the quarry owner paid for uh, the archaeological investigation because that was, again, outside the planning system. So as I said, there are different types of investigation. It's not just... Um, uh, um, excavation and those different types of um, investigation will produce different types of archive with different things in it. Sometimes there won't be an archive at all. So, for instance, a desk-based assessment is exactly what it sounds like. It's, a, it, it's an overview of the p p documentary record that exists on a site. The, there will often be no need to deposit any of that information with a, a museum. On the other hand, an, <coughs> an evaluation um, uh, or an excavation can produce quite a large amount of material. Um, and then some types of investigation, particularly things like remote survey, um, actually produce more of a, a digital archive and, and, and less of any other type uh, of material and are, are better dealt with as a, as a standalone digital archive. So an archive uh, can, can consist, I mean, uh, these aren't necessarily always in the mix, um, as I've suggested. Uh, they can um, uh, contain material, documentary or paper archive, um, human remains uh, often dealt with uh, uh, in a slightly different way than the rest of the material, and a, and a digital archive. So the material archive um, is all the stuff. 
all the objects, all the samples, the environmental material. Um, uh, they can um, contain um, the small finds, the really beautiful things, the things you might put on display. But um, there's no doubt they also uh, will contain an awful lot of bulk material. Um, this display in the middle of um, pottery wasters, Roman iron slag and Roman bricotage is one of my um, proudest moments that you can actually make a display out of this kind of stuff. Um, but it has real value and um, uh, um, needs to be thought through. The documentary archive, the, the paper stuff, will um, include the written material, drawings, photographs. Um, you can um, uh, suggest how you want uh, your paper archive uh, boxed up and deposited with you, but I would, uh, um, I would suggest you'll probably find it in all sorts of, um, of, of different types of storage and folders. Um, uh, So more specifically, um, you might want to check for things like uh, um, an archive index, so you know what's in there. Um, uh, things that, as Gail uh, uh, often talks about, things that tell the human story, things like the site notebooks, correspondence, um, more important perhaps than we realise. And then also things like the trench recording um, sheets and context sheets, uh, the things that will help you later navigate your way around the archive when it's in store. So as, um, as Kat suggested, uh, uh, human remains will turn up um, in archaeological archives. I would hope that you would always be notified in advance uh, that that was uh, um, going to happen. Um, you can be guided by certain uh, policies and um, external guidance. So in turn, internally, as Kat suggests, um, a human remains policy that sets out how you're going to approach these issues is a really good idea. But externally, particularly the guidance from DC is really useful. But there's also um, guidance from different religious groups like Church of England, uh, from Historic England. So really, there's a wealth of advice out there. Um, I, in terms of acquisitions, um, Museums Worcestershire doesn't routinely uh, accept all human remains that turn up on site. We have a, a management panel, which I think is common at, at Leeds as well, um, and they're made up of museum curators, archaeologists, development control archaeologists, and we will uh, decide whether or not we will acquire human remains on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, the DCMS guidelines ask you to weigh up the, the scientific and research potential of those remains against the sort of ethical and moral obligations to rebury. And, and in it, doing that in a sort of panel or committee way means that you get a wealth of different experience and, and thoughts um, to make a more rounded decision. Um, we also use our human remains policy to guide us on how we um, care for the human remains, how we store them, uh, what we do about research requests and display requests. Um, so it's a really, really useful document. And then there's the digital archive. Um, uh, uh, really, I think um, there's that material that's born digital, maybe photographs taken on a digital camera, um, spreadsheets that have been created on computer that belong in that digital archive. But then there's also scanned material, um, uh, handwritten sheets and things that are later scanned and, and then enter the digital archive. And really, you need to make a, um, a decision on whether or not those elements belong in the digital archive, they belong in the paper archive, they belong in both. Um, uh, but um, I think um, uh, it's taken us a long time to get to the uh, position where, as a sector, we realise the value of the digital archive and what we would lose by not um, uh, preserving that information. Um, there's certainly an awful lot of digital material on servers um, and, and on old, you know, floppy disks and so on um, that's, 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 that's sitting out there that's inaccessible. Um, at Museums Worcestershire, we have written into planning briefs since 2013 that all uh, digital, ar uh, digital archives should be archived for long-term preservation. Um, but that still means we've got the material from you know, before 2013, for which currently there's no plan. And I think um, because of the cost of archiving, 
uh, it's important to sort of encapsulate that with, with that um, moment of deposition um, because after that there, there isn't the resources or the, or the money in order to, to, to deposit really. So just to add to that, the Mendoza Review of Museums requires Historic England um, to provide an action plan on how to make archaeological archiving more sustainable. And one of the recommendations that came from that plan is that museums should be relieved of the responsibility of curating the digital archive that comes from the development process and that there'll be a, a direction for that material to be deposited with a trusted digital repository, which we all know is actually really the archaeology data service because they're the only ones that have the expertise and the capacity to do that. Um, there is a document on our website, as in SMA's website, which you can import into your collecting policy, which tells you something about that process and how to encourage um, units to do it. So um, uh, some units and um, contractors will still try to deposit archeolo uh, archaeological digital archives with you directly on things like disks. Um, you can accept them, but as we know, they won't last a distance. They're not, that's not digital archiving. That's the means of transporting the digital archive to a repository. Um, so it's up to you whether or not you um, you take them, often they're included in the back of uh, reports or in the paper archive box. Um, uh, but this re isn't really instead of digital archiving, um, uh, units will still need to be directed uh, towards those trusted repositories or that trusted repository. And yeah, for, for um, um, most museums now, I would say that is the archaeology data service um, is probably um, the trusted repository that's uh, most, if not only used. Um, I understand that since the uh, um, Mendoza report and SMA guidance has come out that actually um, museums now in relieved of that obligation and encouraged that there's been a massive surge in the rewriting of deposition guidelines, museum deposition guidelines to in include the archaeology data service um, for which the archaeology data service weren't prepared. Um, so I would say that if you're going to do that, if you could get in touch with them first, um, uh, um, actually, there are all sorts of things you can do to make the process much easier. And uh, one of those things that uh, uh, the ADS um, has worked with us on is um, uh, this uh, our own um, landing page within the ADS uh, website. Um, all of uh, Worcestershire's digital archaeological archives are listed in the same place. Uh, and, and that means that uh, there's an ease of use there. It means that if we've got researchers who are coming out to store, um, uh, they only need to be on the, on the one site and in the one place in order to find um, all the archives that we've got. So um, the role of the curator. This is a slide that was used um, some years ago by a colleague um, at an SMA conference to describe um, how she feels about her role as a curator in the face of an enormous amount of archaeological archives. And I'd suggest that for those museums that are collecting en masse, um, this might still resonate, I would imagine, as people are laughing. I mean, it certainly did me. It made me feel a whole lot better that I wasn't on my own. So I'm guessing in this analogy, Rick Grimes becomes the museum curator and uh, the zombies are the, the, the sort of onslaught of archives. Um, uh, that member of the SMA committee, I think I'm allowed to say, it, it, it works here now. <laughs> um, uh, and in the context of, of the last slide, I realise that this now feels more sinister. You're not alone. I meant it to sound reassuring <laughs> rather than, um, than, than that negative. But uh, yeah, you're not alone. In, in the best possible way, you're not alone. So for every site archive that you're working on, it might feel like it's all on you to try and work out what's going on here but you're working with a number of colleagues that I would suggest you should get to know really well and try and meet up regularly for a coffee if you can all together. Um, uh, I think we have a, a situation in Worcestershire where we can sit down and have a coffee. We know what's about to come out the ground, what sites are about to open up, what's in post-ex, what's just been deposited. And you can just make sure that that kind of circle um, uh, uh, unites once in a while and, uh, 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 and everyone knows uh, where we're at. So I would say that the planning archaeologist is the, is the key, really. Um, uh, but also historic environment records, those project managers who are running 
uh, the sites and know exactly what they're expecting to find um, or what they have found. Um, and then uh, for the real nitty gritty, um, those you know, fine specialists who are writing the reports, um, you'll find their reports in the main uh, site report um, and um, they will often make recommendations about what they thought was particularly significant or where they think there's no extra work going to need to be carried out and it gives you a real sense of, of just how important this archive is and which parts of it are, are more important and more useful. You're also part of a much larger uh, process, obviously the, the planning process, but also an, this network of historic environment records, um, which uh, you may well already know about. There are these um, map-based uh, sort of database systems where they record all monuments, um, find spots, events. Um, I think uh, in this area, Newcastle is within, um, is it a, a Tyne, Tyneside? Um, uh, um, uh, historic environment record um, and research frameworks tend to be slightly larger areas so there's one I think in this area for the entire northeast um, but the uh, so the research frameworks um, many are out of date there are all sorts of things that are wrong with them but they still give you a really useful framework of everything we know about a certain area at a, in a certain period and where the gaps in knowledge are so um, uh, you can uh, normally download them uh, um, uh, from the internet um, and you can then try and place your site archive within this larger context of what's going on in your region. And as the museum archaeologist, you have a role in the whole process. Um, and I would suggest that everyone gets a copy of, the, I, I think this book has been really, really useful. Kat's got a copy, um, but you can also download it as a PDF from the uh, Archaeological Archives Forum website. It was written by um, Duncan Brown, who's, who, who uh, works for Historic England, and it really sets out um, the responsibilities of every player in this process of um, archaeological excavation and um, and archaeological archives. So as the curator, uh, uh, we have a real clear set of responsibilities. So the first of that, those responsibilities is to ensure that the project team has a copy of your archive deposition standards at the very beginning of the project. Um, so um, Kat touched on um, uh, um, uh, guidelines and, 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 and uh, in deposition and in collecting. Um, this is the museum's uh, Worcestershire we, uh, um, guidelines. So we include uh, things like uh, conditions for accepting archives, um, how we want to be notified that a, a site is about to, uh, you know, a piece of work is about to commence, um, what numbers we want people to use to mark objects. Um, we use the numbers issued by Historic Environment Record, uh, not museum accession numbers. We find it's an easier way to work through an archive later on because the reports will use those numbers, not internal museum numbers. Um, so we're all talking the same language. It includes uh, things, what we'll do about transfer of title. Often sites uh, that need to be deposited will, will not have transfer of title. It happens. Developers go bust, landowners move on. Um, it's what to do under those circumstances. Um, selection retention strategies. Deposition, some, some organisations um, have deposition windows. They might, they might have two weeks or th three months a year where uh, they want all of their archives to be deposited um, in order to cut down on, on that workload and to try and manage it. Um, others, like ourselves, will, will accept depositions throughout the year, but we ask for so many weeks' notice ahead of them. Um, so really, it's whatever suits your organisation. And um, also, uh, fees and charges, um, and um, what to do with digital archives, and really how to prepare the whole archive for, for long-term preservation. So it's also the museum archaeologist's job to liaise with the project executive, the project monitor, the project manager, finds manager and the archive manager. So really you're talking to your um, planning archaeologist in development control, um, you're talking to your historic environment record, you're talking to the project manager at the unit, any find specialists. Um, the key really I think is communication. And so you are going to
some information from them in order uh, um, to expedite this process. You're going to know what's, what's planned and when it's going to happen, when it's going to end, when the post-excavation work is likely to be carried out, what selection and retention strategy is being um, suggested, and I'll come on to that later, um, uh, when the archive is being compiled, when, it, when it's going to be deposited, um, and then you are able to have a say and an influence in all of those areas. Because um, it is, after all, you that will end up holding the baby. You know, we, we're the ones that get left with the archive. So it's, it's pretty important that we have a say in how, how that looks and how it's compiled. Um, but similarly, they need to know information from you, what your standards are, what the costs are, um, uh, how much involvement you want in uh, selection and retention and when. Um, how the archive is going to be checked and what the transfer process is going to be. So it's also the museum curator's job to uh, liaise with the project manager and finds manager in determining retention and disposal policies. Um, this has really um, uh, become increasingly important, I would say, over the last five to ten years. Um, it's, not just, um, it's not just because of the, the lack of space in order to store. I, th I think there's a growing consensus that through selection and retention um, strategies, uh, archives can become more efficient, they can be more usable, they can be better understood. Um, uh, we've been doing it in Worcester now for a, probably about 10 years. Um, and uh, so far we haven't come across any situations where we have uh, not, not taken material that has been uh, later requested. There's always that risk. Um, uh, uh, which is why I think it needs to be a really well thought out and considered a sort of collaborative um, uh, process. So I think it's for a long time it had a, a really bad reputation. I think um, uh, I've heard various members of, um, of staff say things like it's not the museum archaeologist's job, uh, it's the project manager who really understands that site and should say, you know, should, should make suggestions. I've heard people say, well, we have a blanket policy, we throw away, away everything after such and such a date. Um, and I think uh, it's been a very gradual process, um, but there has been um, an increasing understanding of, a, of the necessity. And that's really reflected, I think, in, um, in the guidance and advice that's out there now around this, around this topic. So, um, uh, there is a, a, a guidance uh, on the SMA website, but very recently, um, CIFA uh, published its toolkit for selection and retention. So, that takes you through the process in a step-by-step -step way. You can download uh, both a, a kind of outline of how to, to go about it and um, guidance from the CIFA website. This was... Um, uh, um, developed by the CIFA Archaeological Archives uh, Committee um, over about the last two to three years. In conjunction with stakeholders like us And so uh, this is, um, this I think is an example of the um, tension between selection and retention strategies, which are those uh, case by case, um, strategies written for particular investigations and pieces of work where you take into account the research aims of that project, what they were initially, what was found on site, what the wider context is and what's important about that site, and policies, which is um, sometimes are held by museums, sometimes are held by units, but they will make um, more sweeping generalisations about what type of material is collected and what type of material is disposed of. I'm not massively in favour of, of, of that kind of um, uh, uh, policy and this is um, uh, one of the reasons why this happened to us about eight years ago. So um, uh, Royal Worcester Porcelain is a big deal for the city of Worcester. Um, it's one of uh, um, our best known export sports along with uh, obviously Worcestershire sauce and uh, lesser known gloves, gloving industry. Um, but it it, we have gone through a fairly tumultuous time in Worcester where the porcelain manufactory closed down, a lot of the site was redeveloped, um, local people were made redundant, local people whose families had worked in the industry for generation and generation and generation. So there's a lot of um, emotion around this site and these archives that were being produced. 
um, and the um, uh, a first manufacturer in Worcester was set up in 1750. 1750 is the crucial date. We do have archives from uh, Royal Worcester, but every single one of them has problems for one reason or another. Some have lost all their stratigraphy and all their paperwork because of the decade in which they were excavated. Some of them were lost their funding throughout and were never published. And so this was a really amazing opportunity to get a really good, solid porcelain manufacturing archive. But the excavating unit had a policy of disposing of all um, ceramics post-1600. And our porcelain manufacturer was set up in 1750. And this, to me, demonstrates really clearly why that site-by-site -site strategy is just so important. And these blanket approaches just ride roughshod over any you know, research aims that you might, you, you, you might have been looking um, towards when you started the project. So um, in uh, developing your selection and retention strategy, I, I would suggest strategy. Um, I would say that the first thing that as a curator you need to do is try and work out what the scale of the deposition is because that will guide you on your appropriate response to it, the amount of time and resources that you're going to put into it. So your report and your colleagues will probably be your guide. Um, in the back of um, the reports um, and sometimes associated with specialist reports, you'll get quantification tables that literally give you um, uh, how much, say, ceramic or um, iron slag or whatever in kilograms. So you can work out, you know, in your head that if you've got six, seven, eight kilograms per box, exactly what the size of this archive is going to look like. Um, Box lists and small finalists will also be in that report and will, um, will help you as well. And then this is really where you can do more than almost any other person, I think, in this process, which is the point where you, where, um, you uh, think about the significance of that archive. And uh, some of that will come from the report, particularly specialist reports will guide you. Um, uh, most now will, will uh, suggest, will make a statement of significance. Um, when they report, but also the wider research frameworks that we've, we've talked about, so you can look at your archive in the context of the whole of the, the North East, um, and there will be broader research areas that you've been part of as part of your working lives, and obviously your collections knowledge, because quite often we've faced um, uh, uh, challenges with selection retention where a unit may be proposing to dispose of a certain class of material, but they don't realise the kind of gap that you've got in your collection where actually that would um, sit and solve that problem. So it's not always, I think, museums saying we don't want it. Sometimes actually museums are saying no, on the contrary. We know that material works well for education, for handling, for outreach. Um, so it's really important that you have your say. And in deciding when to have these conversations, um, CIFA's new selection and retention toolkit will help. Um, their suggestion is that really it's a conversation that goes on from the beginning of the process all the way through. There will be certain key points, I think, that are most likely to need your um, input and guidance. Um, and some of that will be dependent on the size of the archive. Um, if it's a very small archive, it might be enough to have a general conversation right at the beginning of the project about what you expect and then once you've got the report in your hand just prior to deposition to make the you know last adjustments but for very large archives um, there may be opportunities um, while for instance the site is still open or um, material specialists are on site that day where it would be prudent to go in and have an actual conversation. Sometimes you can save yourself an awful lot of time just by actually leaving the museum and going to visit site and have a talk to the people who were there. And so this is a case in point really. This is a, a site not far from Worcester Museum um, in the city centre. Um, we had a thriving medieval tile industry in the city. Um, and um, this was, so this was an incredibly important find. Production sites are always exciting when you're talking about industrial archaeology. Um, and it was, I think at the time, the only one that we'd ever found. But not only did it contain tile, it was made of tile. There was a lot of, of tile. <laughs> there was literally tile, um, uh, um, yeah, in the structure, inside it, absolutely everywhere. So um, 
we made decisions on site about what we would collect and what we wouldn't collect. A lot of the tile was all the same fabric. There was no different in, um, uh, in the type of manufacture. Some of it was decorated, that was interesting. A lot of it was plain. And so we made decisions um, on site and reburied uh, quite um, a proportion of that archive. Uh, it never even got back to the unit for post excavation. So there are times when that's absolutely appropriate to do. Um, and as you uh, get more experience in selection and retention, you'll find that there are some really small things that you will be adding into planning briefs and into deposition guidelines that just make the process much easier. And they seem like small things, but the devil can be in the detail. So, for instance, we had an archive that came in where the um, uh, specialist report on the animal bone said something along the lines of this... 20% of the animal bone archive is really significant, you should keep it. This 80% of the animal bone archive is not, it's undiagnostic, you don't need to keep this. And so we said to the unit, lovely, we'll take the 20%. That seems very, very clear cut, except that nobody had separated the two. So there was no way to do that without going back to an animal bone specialist and invest. So I would say just simple things sometimes like, bagging the significant 20% separately um, can make life much, much easier in the long run. And it's also our responsibility to arrange for copies of the digital archive to be submitted to a recognised digital facility. And as we keep saying, that's largely um, uh, ADS in this, uh, in this area. And to store all archive material to accepted standards. And again, um, I would say that Duncan's book literally goes through material types um, and describes the best form of packaging, uh, the best uh, humidity levels, temperature levels. So um, at museums Worcestershire, we uh, don't store archives together. We store them separately according to material type. So our metal work is uh, um, obviously in Stuart boxes uh, with silica gel, but it's also within a climate controlled store, whereas our pottery um, is uh, uh, in the main body of the store where there's no heating control or anything like that. Our human remains are also in a separate area that's uh, um, climate controlled. Um, so that will be a decision for your individual museums and your individual circumstances. Um, but it, is, it can be quite tough to get the right um, environmental levels for each material type when you're trying to keep your archives all in the same part of the store. Um, so this is um, uh, um, a uh, box of archive that was um, deposited with, I think, Southampton Museums when Duncan Brown worked at Southampton. Um, uh, obviously, this is not up to um, standard. Um, it's not that bad, I've seen much worse. The fag packets and matchboxes from Bristol being a case in point. But um, uh, this is why it's important to check your archive when it comes uh, th through the door. Um, I have on occasion sent archives back on the van um, that, because the amount of resources and the amount of staff time in um, repackaging your archives is, um, is enormous. Um, and so actually it's part of the deal that those archives uh, um, uh, arrive in a state that you can, that you can curate them in. Um, this kind of plastic is really low quality. Um, I found in my experience, I don't know about other people, but even fines bags um, uh, are, only seem to have a lifespan of something like about 20 years and they start to shred. So this is a process that you're going to have to keep going back to anyway. Um, because of course the problem with that is as soon as your fines bags go, if, if, if the only documentation is written on them, it's essentially lost and you've got a box full of powder and some objects. Um, this is Duncan's after photograph, it's beautiful. And so, as I said previously, there's no doubt that there is a, um, a crisis in archaeological storage. Oh, we face it ourselves at, at Worcestershire. 
um, we are literally taking down um, narrow racking and putting up wider racking in order to make the most of every square metre of store space. Um, this is an animal bone archive from our Deansway um, excavations. One of those excavations from the late 80s, early 90s that was just enormous. Um, we've got 500 boxes of animal bone alone from that one excavation. And, um, and so uh, we were one of uh, the five pilot studies for the SMA um, uh, scoping rationalisation project about a year and a half ago now. And I think um, uh, um, our takeaway from that project was that although scoping for rationalisation is a really useful thing to do in its own, to its own end, um, it's not cost effective um, really to um, put into, uh, into practice. Um, we found that the costs of uh, um, rationalisation, if you were to do everything that you would hope to do, including those kind of uh, quantifications and assessments on archives that have come in without any documentation, you know, there's, there's still potential in those archives. So if you want to retain that potential, um, we, we were looking at somewhere around about £500 a box to do a proper job. Um, and that's, that, that doesn't um, pull it, you know, that doesn't include any cost in the actual uh, uh, disposal. Um, so um, I, I would suggest that in recent years, what, what organisations have done is, is sort of push ideas to their limits to see where they'll go, but I'm not sure we're really anywhere um, yet with, a, with sort of solving that issue of, of what happens next with storage. Um, obviously, there are museums that have decided to move into uh, salt mines, and um, we did look at it ourselves. The amount of preparatory work um, is uh, pretty phenomenal, um, and um, uh, you, you know you really have to um, get to a very high standard of uh, documentation and packaging in order uh, to put those um, boxes in, um, in order to be able to find them again and get them back out again. Um, I've, we've heard a, a, a lot of discussion around these kind of super stores. Um, uh, um, I'm, I think there's still an awful lot of work to do that presumably SMA will be, will be part of. And then it's also our uh, responsibility to liaise with the historic environment record to ensure accessibility of the documentary archive. Um, I don't know how many of you are uh, regular in, regularly, regularly in touch with your local uh, historic environment record. Um, uh, it's the way in for an awful lot of researchers. In t uh, that's where they would go to find archaeological material, for instance, from a certain period in your county or a certain area. And they, they are the ones who will be able to signpost people to you and uh, your stores. But as with any database, it's only as good as the information in it. And you may well find um, that there is information that you hold that you know about that's not on the HER. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work over the years really to try and um, um, make sure that uh, our data is as good as it can be. And then um, the, the last responsibility that Duncan talks about is the um, provision of access to all parts of the archive. And um, I won't go into that too much because I, I think that's um, uh, what we're talking about this afternoon. Um, one of uh, um, the, 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 the key methods of that uh, for us, obviously, is uh, research requests. We have found that um, there's been a real sea change, I think, over the last five years where we didn't have many requests at all. It felt like there was an awful lot of work going on around kind of landscape archaeology, that kind of thing. But, but more recently, we've had more and more and more artifact requests. So um, uh, we've had nice ones around the porcelain manufacturers uh, and um, cruciform brooches and human remains as well. And I, uh, this is one of my um, uh, favourite parts of the human remains collection. It's a mandible from somebody who died in Worcester in about 1840, and he's got pipe grooves in both sides of his mouth where he habitually moved his pipe from one side to the other all day long. Um, uh, we use our archives um, through uh, our exhibitions. Um, in recent years, we've worked on uh, Roman exhibitions, Iron Age, 
um, lost buildings, and most recently, um, an Ice Age exhibition. Um, it was a year and a half long project in order to uh, look at the Ice Age in Worcestershire, uh, a backwater for Ice Age research really, but definitely a story to tell. And um, uh, this is a lovely example of how uh, seemingly very dull environmental samples in archaeological archives can just be used in the most glorious way. So um, this is a site at Strentham Services on the M5 in Worcestershire and um, uh, there was an archaeological investigation there when they were doing some development work and motorway widening and this um, sort of uh, very um, muddy landscape where there's um, an anim animal bone archive of um, mammoth bone, red deer bone, hyena and we worked with a visualiser um, and digital artist called Peter Lorimer who used all of the um, environmental information in this archaeological report and in that archive to produce a 360 um, virtual landscape of Strentham in the Ice Age. So every plant and animal that's in this uh, reconstruction, um, the information has come from that archaeological archive. And then, uh, again, I won't go into this. Obviously, uh, same as all of you, we use our archives for outreach and engagement particularly volunteering. We've had hours and hours of happy repackers, reboxers, um, uh, working on our archives. Uh, they've been tremendously useful for education, formal learning and also informal learning. Um, uh, we've taken our museum out onto the high street. Archaeological material, particularly bulk materials, um, uh, um, are no less significant than any other. Um, museum object but you do have them in greater quantity and so they can be really really useful um, in order to allow people to touch and to feel and to experience museum objects in other ways and that's it from me any questions